serpent is more clever than any wild animal God has made. One day, he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replies. It is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced, so she took the fruit and ate it, then gave some to her husband, who ate it too. Suddenly, their eyes opened, and they felt shame at their nakedness. As the cool evening breezes blew, the man and his wife heard the sound of God strolling in the garden. They hid in the trees of the garden. God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replies. That's why I ate it. Then God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed. More than all animals, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. You'll give birth to your babies in pain. And to the man, he says, since you listened to your wife, and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. Getting food from the ground will be as painful as having babies is for your wife. Sweating in the fields from dawn to dusk until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, stationed mighty angels to the east of the garden, and placed a flaming sword to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So every morning, Stephanie and I uh, have breakfast together and wrestle with some of the tough questions in the world. And, you know, we don't necessarily ask the tough questions like philosophers or theologians might but we address them in terms of our own life, uh, especially like when tough things are happening. You know, when when difficulty comes, that's when we start to ask the difficult questions. And I asked uh, all of you and and the first service as well over uh, the late spring to turn in questions that your most pressing question that you have for God. And we put this series together, a little, little seven-part series. They all kind of fit into that. And today, we're, we're at a question that is really, really hard to answer. Every time I think about that, that I thought this was a good idea, uh, I, I start to question that, and, and especially today. Uh, because as you hear that story uh, that was just read to you from Genesis, uh, the, the fact is uh, God gave the opportunity for people to make choices. And it's interesting as we think then to answer that question that we have for God, God, why did you allow sin to happen? Because so many things happen as a result of the answer to that question. For instance, I was in Belarus for quite a few trips and we went to this little village memorial called Hatin. And Hatin represents the 186 villages that the Nazis burnt to the ground in Belarus during World War II. Now, the thing that they would do is that they would gather all the people of the village together, they'd put them in one single barn, and they'd burn that barn to the ground. Men, women, young and old, even babies, they'd put in there to die. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why would God allow that kind of atrocity, that kind of sin to happen? But then you have your own experiences where things have happened to you. And you think to yourself, where was God? Why didn't God intervene? 
Uh, you know, the, the fact is, it, it brings up a lot of questions. If God is powerful, all-powerful, and he hates sin, why did he allow it to happen? If God knew sin would happen, why did he make the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at all? And why did he make the serpent who could tempt his people? Why did he make Lucifer, the fallen angel of heaven that we know is Satan? And that's a whole question we won't get into today. But why would he let these things happen? Well, they're, they're all very good questions, but I've, I've just got to be honest with you. Uh, the motivation of God is not addressed in the Bible when it comes to sin. Why? God would allow it? It doesn't say. Nowhere in the Bible is there a scripture that specifically states the answer to that question. And as a result, we can only do our best to, to, to take what we do know, what he has provided for us, to come to some kind of understanding. But the first thing is this. We have to admit this. The question itself, why would God allow sin to happen has a few basic assumptions in it. First, that God is a good God. Uh, the second is that a good God loves and knows all. And, and third, because God is good and loves, he wants what is good and loving for those he has created. So if we come into it, we all might say, you know what, I believe all of those things. That's the foundation then for the question. Why would that kind of God allow sin to happen in his created world. Now, stay with me. Some of you are like, oh, wow, this is really deep today. I don't know if I want to go there. Well, stay with me because it matters to your life. And before we begin, we have to define a very important term in the question, the word sin. I mean, what is that anyway? Uh, one of the scriptures actually defines sin this way. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So in other words, when you do what you're not supposed to do or you don't do what you're supposed to do, it is considered a sin against God, a violation of God. So here it is. Sin boils down to this. It's a distrust of what God has said. In other words, you don't trust that his word is actually motivated in a loving way that's in your best interest. So when you sin, you're exercising your free will to find fulfillment in something other than God. Now, let me make sure you heard that again. So when you sin, you exercise your free will to find fulfillment in something other than God. That, that's what a sin is. He provided the option, but he did not create sin. Human beings created sin. Now, many scholars disagree on this. And as a result, they define sin differently. Some say it's simply missing the mark. That's what the word in the original language means. Others say it's a willful transgression against a known law of God. Another would say it's any falling short of any of God's perfect standards. And you have all of that. And to be honest with you, they're all accurate portrayals of what it means to sin, to find fulfillment in something other than God. So in understanding that, we have to tackle this question today then, why did God allow that sin to happen? Because trust me, sometime in your life, you're going to bear the consequences of sin, either your own or the sins of other people. Something is going to happen to you probably more than once. Uh, that are a result of this original sin. But here's something I want you to know, and this we have to lay as the foundation first before we try to answer this question. Here it is. God is in control even if things happen that he doesn't want to happen, like sin. You see, now I want you to understand that. We call it free will. God gives every human being the right to make their own decisions, including you. And God chose not to create pre-programmed robots who were required to love him and trust him and obey him. Uh, that's not what he desired. So let me, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. So suppose I'm taking my wife, Stephanie, to a romantic dinner. 
and there's candlelight and it's beautiful and it's all perfect. And I look across the table at those big, beautiful blue eyes and I say, Stephanie, I love you. And she looks back at me and asks, why do you love me, Steve? Now here I have this awesome opportunity. I can tell her all the great things about her, how beautiful she is, how smart she is, just all of the ways that, that, that are the reasons why I love her. It's a great opportunity to pour value into her. She looks at me, she asks, why do you love me, Steve? And I reply, because my mother told me I have to. Now, let me just tell you, <laughs> that is not going to go well for me. Um, she, she'll, she'll be upset. We'll hear the, the alarms going off, right? Mah, 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 wrong answer. And, and uh, she'll throw water in my face, and I'll wonder why she's not speaking to me for three weeks. But, but the, the fact is, how is it to be loved because someone is required to love you? See, that's not what God intended when he created human beings. He created us of our own volition to want to love him and to serve him. He's not interested in us choosing to love him because our mothers told us we should. Rather, he's interested in our own free will choosing to trust him and love him. Now, that doesn't mean that God is now somehow subservient in the choices of his created beings. He's not at all. That's what makes him God. He is able to be sovereign over all he's created while at the same time giving human beings the choice to trust him. Now you say, wow, that, how does that go together? That seems weird. Well, we'll look at Proverbs 16.9. Here's a simple statement that might help us. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Uh, in other words, the Bible shows us that God has complete control over the history of humanity while permitting us to make choices of our own free will. To be honest with you, I have no idea how he does that. All I know is that I can make my plans, well, the, but the Lord will ultimately have his way. Only God could do that. He's God, not me. And so in order for, for, to give us a choice whether or not we'll trust him, God puts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the garden. Think about that for a second. He has this whole garden, and, and, and the, the tempter even asks the question, Aren't you, are you not supposed to eat the, tree from the, uh, the, the fruit from the trees? And Eve replies, well, yeah. I mean, we can eat fruit from any tree we want in this whole garden. He's only told us one place that we're not supposed to eat it. And really, that's how it is in our lives. I mean, there is so much he, we're allowed to do that's in our best interest that we could be choosing and instead for some reason we go to that thing that we know is wrong and we choose it. And he says, I haven't lost control of the situation just because you did that. He knows what's going to happen which leads many to conclude that God created sin because he created the option to sin. And that's not the case at all. God created the choice to trust his word and human beings exercised the choice to do the one thing he told them not to do. And thus, men and women, sin enters the world in all of creation and infects every human being since then. And, and by the way, that's how I like to refer to it. Some people refer to it in some translations of the original language, refer to it as sin nature. Uh, but, but honestly, I think it's the infection of our human nature with sin. If you look at the words, that, that's what's happened. Now, all of us have this passion, this, this bent, this drive to choose the wrong thing, to try to find fulfillment in something other than what God has said. Has he lost control? Absolutely not. Now, to repeat, only a truly sovereign God could accomplish his perfect will through the free will of human beings. Look what the psalmist said. Just to make clear, he hasn't lost control. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty, his complete control, his complete power, his sovereignty rules over all. Now, 
if you read the entire book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, you're going to find out that he's got this all under control, that he wins in the end, that we who believe in him win in the end. But this is where we struggle with the question. After all of that, some might think that if God is loving and in control, sin's existence makes absolutely no sense because so much pain comes from it. And, and I get it. And you know, next week's sister question to this week's question, it, it, God, why do you allow suffering? Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. But let's see what the scripture says today to help us. Now, in, in his letter to his friends in Rome, his Christian friends in Rome, Paul writes them about how human beings chose darkness instead of the light of God. How they traded things of truth for lies. And well, here's what he said. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. You see, here's the thing I want you to hear as as we're trying to plow through this. God could intervene and remove all sinful actions and their consequences, but then he would be eliminating free will. So in other words, the important phrase of the verse we just read, here it is, God gave them over. He let them do whatever their sinful desires wanted to do. Whether it was misusing their bodies in sinful sexual expression or worshiping idols, he permitted sinful choices. I mean, can you imagine? Here they are, he's saying to them, here they are, totally deceived, believing that somehow they could build something to be worshiped. And so they would build with their own hands idols and bow down to worship them. Somehow believing that that worship of an idol would fulfill them more than worshiping the God who created them. It seems crazy, doesn't it? And yet it's what we do every time we sin. We end up worshiping something other than God. And, and it's so interesting because why don't we, we say, why doesn't he intervene then? Why doesn't he change all of this? Why doesn't he stop all of this sin and the, and the consequences of it? Well, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. It, it, many of, of you have probably read articles where a drunk driver kills someone as a result of his or her driving, and, and they live through it, but someone else dies. And you say, now, why doesn't God intervene in that situation? Why doesn't he stop any bad thing from happening because of that drunk driver? Well, here's what would have to happen. Some, one or all of these things would have to happen. First of all, God would have to require the person who drank too much and got drunk from, uh, to not drink too much and get drunk. He would have to change his decision or her decision to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing then would be that he would have to change his or her decision to actually now drunk, get in a car and drive. And he would have to change the decision of the victim from being in the area where the person who was driving drunk was, that another decision would have to change. And all through this scenario, God is requiring people to make decisions other than the decisions they want to make. And so he chooses to allow freedom in that situation. And as a result of the bad choices of some and just the choices, not bad, of others, a person ends up dead in a car accident because of drunk driving. And, and we all scream, God, where are you? Why didn't you do something? Well, if he was going to stop every drunk driving death, if he was going to stop every negative consequence of a bad decision, of a sinful choice, he would just have to eliminate the possibility of sinful choices. Because sinful choices cr often create negative results. And here's the thing. Whenever someone makes a symbol, sinful decision, we typically have those negative consequences. And we would be then back to where we started, do you remember where we started? That God has provided every one of us a choice 
as to whether or not we will trust him and obey him. He allows sin to exist so that the free will of human beings is not compromised and we can choose ourselves whether or not we will love him. And we will not be required to, obligated to, pre-programmed to. In other words, God chose to let us choose. And because we are now born with the infection of sin and we have this bent to do things wrong, and I don't know about you, but we often do. Uh, I often do. And a- a- as a result, we, we become trading, we're trading the truth of God for a lie. We're trying to find fulfillment in stuff other than what he wants for us. But in his sovereignty, he's in con- total control and he can choose whether or not he wants to intervene. Can God intervene? Of course he can. You know, that's why he's called us to pray and to ask for him to intervene. But whether or not he does is still completely up to his sovereign will. So now we have two choices. We'll obey or we'll disobey. We'll obey or we'll choose something that dishonors him. He wants us to have the choice as to whether or not we will glorify him in our lives. Some choose to trust him. Some choose to exchange the truth of God for a lie. But keep in mind, listen, we can't even take credit for our right choices. We can't even take credit for it because it is God who has made a way for us to overcome sin. That's what he said, uh, Paul, same guy, wrote to his friends now in Ephesus, and he says this. Read along with me as as you see it on the screen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise, listen to this, to the praise of his glorious grace which he freely has given us in the one he loves. You see, here's here's what I want you to understand. We believe God has poured out this opportunity to have all of this sin forgiven. But God's grace is, given to those who believe is ultimately what brings him glory. See, the Bible makes it clear. We cannot save ourselves with our good choices or our good works. God allowed sin to enter the world and enter the heart of every human being. But he also had a plan from the beginning to deal with our sin and the reality of his character of love. Now here we are, we, we got to go back to the assumption that's there for, for just asking the question, why would God allow sin? Remember the assumptions? We believe in a good God, a good God loves and knows all, and because God is good and loves, he wants what is good and loving for those he created. So that's the assumption we have when we ask the question. Yet in his holiness, his purity, his righteousness. He cannot tolerate sin. And uh, uh, so how will sinful humanity bring him glory if we're all marred, if we're all dirty, if we all need washed and cleansed and forgiven, if we're all sinful, how in the world can we bring a holy God glory? Well, by God coming to the world himself and taking our eternal consequences upon himself when he dies on the cross. This is how he reconciles us to himself. So it's not our free will choice to believe and receive his grace that brings him glory. It's his grace alone. And we're just the beneficiaries of it. That brings him the honor that this verse tells us, the praise, here it is, to the praise of his, what? Glorious grace. Not to the praise of our ability to believe. Not for the praise of our choice to trust him. No, no. To the praise of his glorious 
grace which he's freely given us in the one he loves. That would be Jesus. Now look, I am incapable of bringing God glory due to my sin. Only his grace imparted to me allows me to make the choice, empowers me to make the choice to receive his forgiveness and bring him praise. That's what we have to get. This, he's allowed sin to happen through our choices, and he's allowed grace to be imparted to us through our receiving it. So why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want to make the only choice possible that will honor him? You don't have to stay in sin. That's his whole point. You can be set free because of God's amazing grace. Now, in his book, uh, Proof, by Timothy Paul Jones, he, he tells an amazing story that I think will help explain this to you. Now, he and his wife adopted a little girl. The thing of it was that this little girl had actually been adopted by another family before, and, and he didn't go into the reasons why she ended up uh, available for them to adopt, but they ultimately adopted her. What they discovered then is that this little girl's previous family that she was part of would often take their biological children to Disney World, but would never take her. They just left her with someone to watch her while they took the rest of the family to Disney World. And so Tim said, the first thing we did when we found out about this was schedule a trip to Disney World. We were going to make sure she got that experience. Well, what's interesting is he said for a month before they left, she was awful. Awful. He said she would steal food when we'd be more than willing to give her food if she just asked. She would lie to us. She was insulting her older sister all of it. She said it was really very difficult during that time. And, and he said, finally, I had to just, you know, go talk to her and pull her up on my lap. And, and he said, she looked at me and said, I know what you're going to do. He said, what? She said, I know that you're going to tell me that you're not going to take me to Disney World. And he said, every fiber in my being wanted to do that <laughs> because she had been so bad. He said, but I looked at her and said, wait a minute, are you part of this family? And she nodded her head, yes. And he said, and this family's going to Disney World, right? And she said, yes. And he said, well, if you're part of this family, you're going to Disney World as well. And so she smiled and she was so happy and they went to the, and she continued to act poorly all of the way up to the trip, even on the trip to Disney World. She acted poorly. But, but, but when they got there, they experienced Disney World as you know it. Uh, expensive food, expensive games, long lines, and, and, and just enough manufactured magic to make you want to come back the next day. You know, there it is. They did all of that. And so that night, the fir of the first night, they're in the hotel room. And Tim said, I kneel down to pray by my daughter. And I, I ask God to, you know, to bless her life and, and all of the things I prayed for her. When I'm done praying, she looks up at me and she says this. She said, Daddy, I understand now that you didn't bring me to Disney World because I'm good. You brought me to Disney World because I'm yours. And men and women, that is God's extravagant grace that he offers to every one of us who have been put into this world of sin and have been given a choice whether or not we will be fulfilled by what God wants for us or other things, idols in our life. And he's saying to you and to me, look, you got a problem. And that problem is a problem that's been passed down to you from generations since the beginning of time the tree was put in the garden. He's saying, but I want you to know that I love you so much that I've got a plan for that problem. And it's my grace. And I'm ready to give you this gift of forgiveness and eternal life if you'll trust me and just receive it. And in doing that, men and women, here's what he wants you to know. That the sin that is in the world is now destroyed in your life. And you can know 
that you have eternal life in him. Not because, not because you're good, but because you're his. If you trust in him. You know, it, it really is a simple prayer. A complicated question is answered for you individually with a simple prayer. Lord, I own my sin. You know, I've done it. I admit it. I'm, I'm confessing it to you. I've done it. Just like every other person who's ever walked the earth other than Jesus, I own my sin and I confess it. But I'm saying to you today, I receive your forgiveness. I believe in you. I trust you. Thank you for forgiving me. Why did God allow sin to happen? <laughs> I really have no idea. But I know this. He's given me the free will to choose his grace. And he's given you that same opportunity as well. So that your sin can be washed away. You can be right with him and know that you have eternal life.